so good morning, everyone. Thanks to those of you who um, managed to show up today. And uh, thanks to ARCO for the invitation on behalf of all the Talking Galleries team. Uh, Lucia Holmes was supposed to be here. He's the director of Talking Galleries. Unfortunately, he's sick, so I'm covering up for him. And of course, thanks to Christina and Courtney for their time and participation. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Talking Galleries is, is a platform dedicated to debate issues around the gallery sector. But apart from that, it also stimulates interesting reflection on the contemporary art world at large. And this is what we will be trying to do today with Christina and Courtney. Uh, Talking Galleries' main event takes place once a year in Barcelona, but they also organize events internationally with different collaborators from museums, uh, art foundation and galleries of course. Um, the reason why we're here today is to debate the role of young collectors in um, important museums such as the Museum of Contemporary of Modern Art in New York and the Museum of Modern Art in Barcelona. Um, what we are uh, trying to, what we'll be trying to assess here is the role of young collectors in the museum, their profile, what they can bring in uh, in the shaping of the collection of a uh, museum. And I think it will be very interesting to do it from the perspective of two uh, similar yet so different museums such as the MACBA and the MoMA. To do so, we'll count on the contribution of Courtney Schaefer, who's the assistant director of affiliate programs at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She's been with the museum since 2013, and she oversees four patron groups, managing areas such as membership, fundraising, and event planning. Um, she's a graduate of the University of Virginia, and she studied art history and French. She continues to support her alma mater by serving on the school's Art Council, as well as president of the board for the New York Regional Club. Then we have Cristina Lopez, who's the director of the MACBA Foundation, a private not-for-profit organization that has a mission to create the MACBA collection. After working 15 years as a head of communication and marketing in both multinational companies and public institutions, Cristina decided to focus on her passion, which is contemporary art. In 2013, she joined MACBA Foundation as a communication and fundraising manager, and since 2016, she holds the position of director. During this time, the foundation has increased the number of private collaborators, multiplied the sponsorship in initiatives to the museum, and has intensified its work of dissemination of the region of the collection. So I will now leave the floor to them. Uh, they will give a brief inter introduction of uh, the MoMA and MAPA programs aimed at young collectors and, and patrons. And then I will direct them a few questions. And if there's time, we'll open uh, the floor to, to the question. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to give a brief overview um, of some of our programs in New York and um, taking it back to the mission of the museum. So you probably or hopefully recognize this image. This is our museum on 53rd Street in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we also have a sister institution, MoMA PS1, uh, which focuses on contemporary art, and that is in Long Island City in Queens. Uh, of course, with all of these um, membership programs talking about donors, it's important to think about the collection and the mission of the institution, right, while we're all doing what we do. So when MoMA was founded in 1929, it was founded as an educational institution, um, really with the focus of being the best um, conservator and presenter of modern and contemporary art. And just to underscore something about the mission, it's really about focusing on the audience and the people that are coming in and out of the doors every single day, from scholars to young children, and of course, um, our donors and supporters, young patrons, senior patrons, collectors. This is a um, just general overview of sort of how the museum is structured in terms of membership and contributions. Um, a hierarchical structure. At the top, of course, there's our board of trustees, which are our um, very generous uh, supporters, many long-standing patrons. Um, I think with every institution, it's important to have a diverse board. So you have um, people representing various backgrounds, 
different ideas to throw things in the mix. Um, and of, of course, with this long-term support and generous support is, is critical. Uh, after the board, we also have various giving circles. Uh, we have a group called the Chairman's Council and the Director's Council. And these are um, larger um, you know, annual contributions. In turn, these members are getting programming, getting access to uh, senior collectors, to our director. And it's kind of an insider track. Um, several of them are also trustees, no surprise. And we also have curatorial committees. Um, with our six curatorial departments, every um, department has representation. A trustee chairs that. And um, those individuals vote on acquisitions that are coming into the collection per each department. Um, after this group, we have our major gifts department, which um, you would think is something that I'm involved in day in and day out, but it's actually a separate um, group of development at MoMA. We have a lot of different groups, as you can see. And at the museum, we qualify major gifts as 10,000 and above. So an annual contribution of that amount and above. Uh, the affiliate groups is my domain, also known as patron groups, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, after the affiliate groups, we have smaller curatorial councils. So when you're first starting at the museum and say your passion is architecture and design or painting and sculpture, but you haven't really established yourself with your collection or with your giving and relationship with the museum, these are kind of a good um, entry point depending on if it's a specific interest in the specific medium that you want to support. And then last but not least, uh, and certainly always important to remember, is membership. It's kind of the fundamental entry point um, to the museum and why the whole donor structure exists. And um, obviously at every institution, membership follows a different pattern. Some museums don't even charge for admission or you know, have uh, as robust membership programs. For us at MoMA, it comprises roughly a fourth of our revenue, so it's very important, um, and it's an annual initiative, and there's a lot of work that my colleagues in the membership team do. And with our membership program, as a MoMA member, $85 a year is the individual level, sort of the base for entry. These are just some of the benefits um, that are provided. Um, obviously, focusing on bringing people into the museum, seeing the exhibitions, giving, getting that first look, um, coming in early for member early hours. Of course, discounts, you know, members love free things. So um, bringing in um, guests and um, using, we have a couple of stores, both near the museum, we have one in Soho, um, our restaurants, and so much more because um, you know, there's, there's a hook to join, and I think with membership, you want to make sure that um, people feel engaged, people want to know where their money is going, they want to know what the benefits are. So um, just to be sort of transparent about uh, basic privileges that are afforded. Um, obviously, with all of this, the membership goes directly back to the museum. So it's supporting our exhibition program, conservation efforts, educational initiatives, and really um, membership is the best way to um, have an experience at the museum, to feel connected and to feel part of that community. This is a picture um, that I took uh, on my phone a couple years ago but it's um, an artist studio visit with Jeff Koons. You can kind of see him uh, sort of in front of one of the sculptures in the back, um, but it's about 35 people. These are senior collectors, a group that I work with, but I just wanted to show this image um, sort of as a precursor to why we have affiliate groups, patron groups. It's um, bringing a group of individuals together with a like-minded interest, with an interest in contemporary art and modern art, supporting the museum. Um, but obviously, by being a part of this group, they can, um, with museum's name, they can go into Jeff Kuhn's studio and meet with the artists and hear creative process and, um, and learn and socialize and um, just even have a further level of engagement. 
So I mentioned earlier affiliate groups and that donor structure and kind of where they fall into place. At MoMA, these are really our mid-level donors. Um, they are paying around $1,000 a year, as high as 10, just to get into the major gifts category. And um, certainly the goal, I think, with affiliate groups is long-term engagement and um, to grow the relationship with the institution to start, you know, as an $85 member, join the Young Patrons Group, the Junior Associates, go on to join a curatorial committee, and maybe one day join the board. Um, these are the four affiliate groups in my purview, my department. And obviously today we're talking about young collectors and why they're so important, but I just wanted to point out um, these four groups and their categories. The Contemporary Arts Council is our senior collectors, and they were really our first young patrons group. Um, so we've been doing this since 1949 when the Contemporary Arts Council was established. At that time, they were the second oldest affiliate group after our Board of Trustees. And then they all grew up, and uh, obviously contemporary art has, has transformed, and um, they all started having kids. They wanted their kids to be involved in a program. Um, so when they were first founded, they were called the Junior Council. They were renamed the Contemporary Arts Council, and then our junior associates, our young patrons, were officially established in 1990. So they're a little bit over 25 years old. And in my department, I also work with our, the Friends of Education, whose focus is African American art. Um, it came out of our education department as an initiative to focus on art that was underrepresented in the collection. And we also have a family council whose focus is to bring in families with young kids, um, engage them in the museum, starting that education early. And a lot of the programs that we do are conceived directly with our education department. Um, so we have docents and um, museum educators that are really well versed with um, interacting with kids and art, probably much better than me. Uh, so the Junior Associates, this is sort of an unofficial mission statement, but really it's, it's a group description. I would say that the mission statement falls back to the museum's mission of being an educational institution, um, involving a, a wider audience for the public, and just bringing together like-minded individuals of art lovers and supporters. Uh, so as you can see from this description, we define our group as those between the ages of 21 and 40. So it's, it's wide ranging in age. And in turn for their membership, we provide them with a robust calendar of events that runs from roughly September to June. Um, and almost weekly programming. So they keep us very busy, but we do, um, we focus first and foremost what's going on at the museum. So we are organizing curatorial walkthroughs of our major exhibitions. There are opening receptions and parties around those exhibitions, of course. And we are also going out of the museum um, around the city and sort of around the New York community to meet with artists in their studios, to visit galleries, um, to go into people's homes and see their collections. Often it's you know usually a museum um, trustee or a longtime friend of the institution that's opening up their home and sort of educating this next generation of patrons. So um, it's a really incredible way, I think, to build um, a strong audience and to cultivate what we hope are long-term relationships. And like I said, you know, this cultivation is really through the programming. Um, we have a specifically one dedicated staff member who serves as the group's leader. So they're organizing all the programs. They're the, also the ones sending the invitations, hosting the events, doing the welcome, introducing this, the person who's going to speak, and um, just sort of their leader throughout. And as you can see here, in addition to some of the programs I mentioned a moment ago, we also um, now you know, are seeing what art fairs are doing as they're expanding rapidly and, and taking our donors all over, not just the US, but of course um, internationally, like we're here today. Um, another wonderful opportunity and something Christine and I talked about earlier is, is travel. Um, a lot of work goes into those, but those are opportunities too to really be on a bus all day with 25 of your patrons or be on a long trip and see the best of um, the art world that probably one can't do without a museum's name opening up those doors. 
Um, and of course, at the end of the day, we're you know trying to bring back as much support for the museum as we can. So our patrons, especially the junior associates, they're invited and encouraged to attend our benefits and parties. Um, and even though they're a younger audience, we are really seeing them as future leaders of the museum. Just a couple of images before I turn it over to Christina. This is um, uh, the Junior Associates membership brochure from uh, 1990. So a little uh, outdated, <laughs> you can see, and now we've changed our font and other things with our visual identity. But, um, you know, let, more than 25 years ago, paper brochures were sort of um, crucial to spreading the word about the program. Um, this is before everything became online and on social media, which we're now really focusing a lot of our efforts to keep up with uh, changing technology. This is one of uh, the first acquisitions that the group supported. So it's an Arbus uh, from the early 90s. And as you can probably assume, uh, you know, the members are supporting the museum's programs but they're also able to support acquisitions of artwork. Um, so it's really exciting that, you know, once this art, piece of art comes into the museum's collection, the Junior Associates name is going to be on the tagline there. We might have uh, a curatorial walkthrough around the exhibition to focus on it. This is one of the latest, uh, is a Tabor Robach um, that the group funded a couple years ago, sort of speaking about changing technology and, and media, video works. Um, this is uh, an exhibition we had in 2013 called Soundings, a contemporary score. It was in the galleries as well as in our sculpture garden, which you can see here from this image. So um, not just supporting acquisition of artwork, but uh, the exhibition program. And just some pictures kind of from the past. Our curator, Laura Hopman, who is a senior curator today in the Department of Painting and Sculpture. She's giving a tour to the group um, at MoMA PS1. She also, during this time, served as the curatorial liaison for the JAs. This is in 2004, when um, the museum was undergoing an expansion and capital campaign project. So um, I wasn't there at the time, but of course, the museum wasn't just looking to trustees for support. They were calling on young patrons to get involved with the expansion project, to contribute um, individually or as a group, and in turn, um, some bespoke experiences such as, ha such as hard hat tours uh, were able to take place. The group traveled to Berlin in the early 2000s, so this is just an image um, of everyone together. This is, uh, two, these are two images from our conservation lab, so behind the scenes with Chief Conservator, um, again, looking at process, looking at the museum's collection. There's so many things that um, are being worked on that are, this is Demoiselle de Mignon, of course, which is on view, um, but, you know, kind of going to the crux of um, the museum's heart and really by being a patron and connected into this small community, one can um, get that behind, behind the scenes experience. The group traveled to uh, Brazil in 2007. So this is just another fun um, group image. And I think with all of these two, you can see everyone surrounded together. They've spent all day, you know, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. or later, you know, pounding the pavement, seeing all the studio visits, collections, just absorbing as much art as they can. Um, this was one of my first events in 2013 when I first joined the museum. We just went to Brooklyn, which um, 10, 20 years ago did not have the art scene that it does today. Um, and as you can see, you know, standing room only, packed. Uh, we did artist, four artist studios all day. And this is the last image that I'll leave with. Um, we have a holiday party every year in December. It's really a member thank you. We don't charge our members for it. Um, and we're one of the few institutions who sort of throws um, a $10,000 party free for our members. Members can always bring a plus one, so it's a, it's a way to um, hopefully speak up the program and encourage new membership. But um, 
a couple years ago, the GA celebrated their 25th anniversary. You can't really quite see from the balloons as they're turning, but they're supposed to say GA 25. So during this year, not just for the holiday party, but the programming throughout the year, we branded with this um, GA 25 logo and did a behind the scenes with our archives department and um, special looks at programs that the group had supported over the years. So you can see how um, the group has, has grown, has transformed, but I think most importantly, um, stuck around at the museum and to this day is still recognized as such an important um, source for fundraising, for long-term cultivation, and, um, and we hope for future support. So I'll turn it over to Christina to give an overview on her group. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Carolina, and thank you, uh, Talking Galleries, for inviting uh, Magua Fundación to participate in, in this debate. Um, I will try to go uh, fast in order to explain you who we are. Um, for us, it's an honor to be here with MoMA, because for us, it's a model that we've been inspired from the beginning. Um, from the ones you don't know, Magba is a quite young museum. We just, uh, it would open 95. The project started, for the ones you don't know, on the 80s. Barcelona was just running for the Olympic candidate and was drawing the new city, not only thinking of which infrastructures they wanted to do in terms of sports or, or motorways, but the mayor of Barcelona decided no way we could wait for more to have a contemporary museum. Um, Barcelona has been host uh, quite renowned uh, artist and it was a shame that we didn't have a contemporary museum. So in the 80s we started building the museum in Raval, which is a very marginal district and the, as it was in Pompidou, it was placed on a district in order to regenerate the, the district. Now, after 25 years, the district uh, has uh, libraries, universities, uh, the Magma Museum, and has changed completely the scenery. Um, we also welcome artists, like here you can see uh, Tapias with Chillida, placing also uh, some of the artworks outside the museum, and also giving to the district what they wanted to, to see, and welcoming everybody. Then, it also had to be decided which model of government we wanted to have. And the mayor of Barcelona decided, quite, I would say, innovative, uh, to build a collaboration, uh, public and private uh, management board. For the first time in Spain, the Museum of Magba Barcelona presented a structure that was not only 100% public, that was something very usual here in Spain, that all the museums were 100% in public hands, supported with 100% public funds. But the mayor of Barcelona decided to put on the Magba um, Museum a public and, and private uh, uh, government. Uh, we have three public administrations, uh, the Barcelona Council, the Catalonia government, and also the Minister of Culture, whose funds uh, helps to run the museum. All the, let's say, the, the fixing costs, all the museum staff, and running all the exhibitions. And also, or part, which is uh, who I am directed to, it's Fundación Magba that was at the beginning of the, of the museum and with a clear mission to get funds from private, either companies or individuals, in order to build the collection. So the Magba Foundation starts before the museum opens in order to acquire funds, and when the museum opened 10 years later, we had something to show. So um, that was the mission we, we have. And who was behind the Magba Foundation? Magba Foundation had 35 trustees, uh, 
that uh, supported a museum that was non-existing, built on contemporary art that for most of them was kind far enough uh, what was about. We, we hardly have some paintings. Most of the things we have, it's installation, video art. So people who really believe on the project. 35 trustees that in 1987 start putting money in order to acquire the collection. After 15, the collection, it's uh, for the ones you, you're not aware, Magba collection starts on 1950, so it's really contemporary art and finishes today. Uh, we still have some artworks uh, shown today in the, in the rooms that uh, has been just produced now. And our objective was not only to have a Catalan, a local uh, Spanish uh, artist represented, but also international artists represented. We wanted to have one party in Barcelona and the rest of the world. It was very important for us not to have only a local view. The best thing you can do if you want to help even local artists is to put them in relation with such the names of uh, Richter, Calder, Matt Mullican, or Marcel Brotires. That's the best way you can help uh, all of them. So, after 15 years, uh, you can imagine that trustees are getting older and older, we decided that it was the time to create new categories. We have two types of donors, the companies and individuals. And we kind of follow what MoMA was doing to have kind of leather uh, individuals like collaborator, protector, benefactor, and different ways of uh, implication, commitment, and also part. We decided to create the young trustees, which was named El Taller de la Fundación. It's not the friends of the museum. It's a group that we ask them a much higher implication, first in terms of resources, that the participation in order to enter to this uh, um, membership, it's 1,500 euros per year, with the mission to have the future trustees that uh, after 15 years are getting older and in longer future we want to create a second base. I would like to talk about them in um, two, two sides of the story. One is the, the target, the profile, and the other is the motivations that they join. We say young because at least for average will be 40 years old. It, okay, it's not millennials, I know. But you have to think that our trustees member were on average 70 years old. So really for us, 40 years old were like kind of a young. But we also had clear that we didn't want to create the Friends of the Museum asking 50 euros or 80 euros per year. We want them to have a much higher commitment and much higher implication. Um, who are they? They are um, architects, lawyers, uh, engineers, um, that has a passion about art. They don't know about art, but they know that it's important to contribute and support the museum. I would say that there's three main motivations. One is philanthropy, per se. They really believe that they have to give support to a museum, that it's a relevant and, a, and a, an icon in the city. The second, I would say, is that they want to learn. They know that through us, they're gonna learn. They're gonna learn the artists, they're gonna learn contemporary art, they're gonna increase their knowledge. And for us, it's important to create this space that uh, will be ambassadors for us, that will talk about us, but also to have them the, the interest in starting to be collectors. For us, it's important to help not only the museum, but also all the cultural sector. If through their knowledge, if through their passion, they start supporting not only us, but start buying artists, start buying through galleries, this is also something that helps all the, let's say, the network of the cultural uh, spectrum. And the third, for sure is that, uh, and you can see here is uh, at the end of the day, 
it's also a leisure and a social part of, of, uh, of them, no? We become friends, we have a, we have a specific uh, program for them um, with curatorial visits when the museum is closed with a director, we go to see this, the artist studio and have the chance to meet them by person, we organize cultural trips and they can see the most relevant fairs or biennials or um, so for us it's important these this two type of things. As I said, our mission is the collection, but after 30 years that we've been growing a collection, starting from zero, now we have almost 6,000 pieces. We decided that, that was like eight years ago, to also give support in order to make it easier to all the different audiences we have to get them closer to the art. How? We have different audiences. We have kids, we have young people, we have families, we have experts, and we have different educational programs that we would like to support. So not only Magba Foundation is building the, con the collection, but also sponsoring educational and social programs in order to make closer the art to different audiences. For instance, here there are some examples. We sponsorship a program for schools that they don't have resources in order to uh, visit the museum. We have also sponsorship a program that has boost and pushed accessibility of the museum. We have also sponsorship a program that um, gives uh, training for teachers to learn about contemporary art. We're giving also tools besides the collection for the museum to expand the audiences in order to get closer because for us it's important at the end that the mission of the museum is going further than the heritage. Um, activities that we've been doing the last uh, years and, and here you can see we do uh, curator Tours. This is one of the last uh, of uh, Rosemary Castoro that it's now on, on the show in Magba. Or sometimes we go and visit the studio. Here it's Antoni Llena, one of the most prominent Catalan artists. Or sometimes we do seminars. Um, one of the difference and, and we wanted to make uh, clear is that we don't want them uh, either trustees or the young trustees to get involved in the decisions of what to acquire. We want to keep independence of the curatorial criteria or what's been acquired in the collection. We don't want to give them extra promise that they can participate in these discussions. We want to preserve this independence that they support us with economic support and they will participate in exclusivity with some activities, but we don't want them to participate in uh, acquisition committees. Of course they know and they have information about the museum and we want them to engage as much as possible with uh, organizing, for instance, uh, presentations of the program exhibition um, behind the scene and for first time for them also having the chance to discuss with the director which and why is that program exhibition uh, being ruled or we also organize um, debates with, um, with the international committee who's deciding the artworks we're acquiring. But we don't want to overpromise them on that thing, we want to keep it completely independent. We also organize cultural trips, these are the ones of the last few years. Every year we come here to Arco Madrid for two days. We organize not only a visit to the fair, but also to, to see the main exhibitions in Madrid. Oh, sorry. And we also go and see private collections. We just been in January to Abu Dhabi uh, with the excuse that we were presenting the collection of Magma uh, next to the Louvre. We, we went there, we also came to Documenta and Castle and also to Munster. 
these are important uh, things that they appreciate in order to be on top of what's going on in contemporary art. And last, um, I would like to mention the kind of the social events that we do, not because of the social impact that can have as a club or as a member that they feel proud of it, but also the impact that they have um, around the city. We still believe that these fundraising events um, give us a chance to increase our target audiences. We make them El Taller de la Fundación to get involved on these fundraising events and make them sell tickets and tables and bring more people. So the capacity that we have that for now, for instance, El Taller de la Fundación is made of 100 people, we're increasing by 10% every year that when we do this, uh, this kind of uh, events. It's also important for them to spread the word in the city and also here in Madrid because we, are, we not only have collaborators from Barcelona, we also have uh, members of Taller de la Fundación from here in Madrid or from Bilbao that they want to be aware of. of. But um, for us it's a part of a source of income because we just do this if we get some funds, we just don't do it as a party. Um, one of the last ones we did was Magbar Night here in the summer, which we did um, in a subasta in order to, to get some funds for, for the museum and acquire more collection. But, um, and of course, as a result, they also feel proud that they have been participating there and they were part of the, of the story of the success. So that's all for me. I think maybe we can leave some time now if anybody has a question or if Carolina, you want to add some more. Yes, first of all, thank you for your insightful presentation. I think it's great that the MoMA and the MACPA have programs directed to uh, young collectors uh, because, you know, you really give people the opportunity to learn about art and to experience art. I have one question for Courtney. If you could expand a little bit more on the profile of the young collectors who are involved in your affiliate program and then one for the both of you uh, about how la likely it would be for these young collectors to eventually become part of the board of trustee of the museum because I think it's really important that boards constantly renovate and bring in new life and I think that we've witnessed a change in collecting practices that is that, that specifically holds true when it comes to young people so you know collectors are becoming more and more engaged in artistic process they're establishing close relationship with artists and so I think that would be something is interesting to think about. Sure. Um, in terms of the profile, I would say similar to what Christina mentioned in Barcelona, the junior associates come from a wide range of professional backgrounds. So lawyers, bankers, um, we have a lot of people who also work in the art world. And it, I think for them, if they're working in a gallery, it's a great um, networking opportunity, a social opportunity. So all different professional backgrounds. Um, they range in age from 21 to 40. So just that mix in and out of itself gives it such a diverse um, makeup. Um, our average age is, the, is early 30s. And I would say we are a little bit heavier on the female side, probably 60, 40. Um, most of our members are individual members, but about 20% are dual. So that's something we really try to encourage if they um, are a couple or are business partners, if they work at a gallery or if they want to bring a plus one. But it's something I think that we could do a better job of. Um, and they mostly live and work in the city, I would say. Um, while I would love to expand our database and bring in more international support or just domestic, you know, regional support, most of them are in the city. Um, and I think the programming is kind of a, um, an incentive, you know, when they see the calendar and it's published online, they sign up. And if they sign up that day, we want to bring them to the event that night. So most of them are uh, local. Yeah, in, in answering your question about uh, how will be the life cycle, 
now about these young trustees becoming on the trustees board members? Yes, I mean, we're a young um, museum, but we have an experience of 30 years. So during these 30 years, there's been two or three people really committed that they started as a young trustees, and in the last, let's say, five years, they've become parts of the members of the board, of the trustees board, because it's part of our mission to regenerate and to fresh and to integrate uh, new blood on the trustees board. Um, we're trying to follow a rule for our trustees board that it's kind of very American, but to really have an active trustees board, you know, to give, get, or get out. We really want members in the trustees board that they can give support, economic support, or they can get access or context, but we don't want people just to have a place, a chair, on a board. And I would say, similarly, we also do want to encourage um, that continuing support, increased support to become a board member. There's certainly a process involved, and um, I think at MoMA we're lucky to have so many groups, but people have to put in their time and um, figure out, too, for themselves, how do they want to support, what are they most interested in. Um, so we've definitely had uh, people who started with the junior associates, joined other groups, curatorial committees, joined the Contemporary Arts Council, and today are very active members of the board. But it really falls down to the individual. It's an individual conversation and a relationship with the museum. Um, but certainly, that's sort of the, um, the icing on the cake in goal. So we might have time for one question. Christina has to catch a plane, but if any of you has any question. Well, th thanks very much for the presentations. I'm um, just wondering whether for those who don't live in New York or Barcelona, you've got any specific membership or you can follow some activities through the website or something like that, I don't know. Hello? Okay, there we go, sorry. Um, I would say for us at MoMA, unfortunately most of our programming is, is in the city. Um, I think it's interesting with art fairs and um, everything going on in our world or internationally, what opportunities might come up. On our website, we are um, just trying to make it more public um, in different languages, having a lot of video content, having um, opportunities to view the collection, do virtual tours. On the programming end, specific to the junior associates, unfortunately, we're not there yet, but it's certainly hope, something that I hope that we can um, better accommodate those audiences. I had coffee with someone this summer who is uh, from Istanbul and uh, worked in the gallery scene, and she only comes to New York a couple times a year, but she wanted to join the Junior Associates. So on my end, you know, when I see she's registering for an event in New York, or if there was, um, if we were all going over, or if just maybe I or a curator was going over to Istanbul, I would try to make that personal connection because I think that's really important to make that member feel that much more connected to, to what we're doing, in it, even if she might be a non-resident. Yeah, in our case, it's a bit similar. Um, as I said before, there are some members that are not only from Barcelona, they're from Madrid and from Bilbao, who has um, the option, of course, they do participate more on the art fairs, on the cultural trips, but they also like to attend to these top high, almost success activities, and they manage to find the time to squeeze in their agendas and, and come. Um, um, yeah, but of course, most of the activity it's, it's in the museum. Okay, so I'm afraid we will have to leave it here because Christina has to run. But um, I know that from Talking Gallery, seeing they're really interested in uh, deepening the, the, the theme.
team that we've been dealing with today. So uh, follow the platform. They, they will for sure organize other events uh, similar to this one. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Christina and Courtney, for your insightful presentation. And have a nice day.